I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer, really specializing in custom strategies based upon your goals, which need to be put first. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We've got a bunch of questions that uh, I'm going to be asked. I don't know what those questions are, which is the way I like it the best. So let's just rock and roll. All right. Do you think the banking crisis is over? And if not, why not? Okay. No, I do not by any stretch of the imagination, think that the banking crisis is over. In fact, I think it's, I think it's a uh, rumbling underneath the surface. And the reason is because we had what 15 years of zero interest rate policies. So the problem that the banks that did go under or big problem that they had was that the value of their securities had declined dramatically as the central bank had raised rates. That is throughout the entire global banking system. So what's really happening right now is the popping of the largest, uh, hard for me to call them asset, but I'll call them a debt bubble in history. No, <laughs> I don't think this is, this is over by any stretch of the imagination. It's just being hidden from view. What do you see coming next with banks? And do you think it's going to be similar to 2008 when three banks collapsed in 2006 or seven, and then another, you know, 10, 20, 100 banks collapsed a year. I do think that there are some similarities, but what I also knew, which is why I even started my urban farm, was that in 2008, when it became apparent to the whole world, the banking crisis did, that um, the system died at that point. So I think the crisis that we have uh, that is not yet visible to the public, but is unfolding as we are sitting here and speaking is much larger because what they did in 2008 was just bury it under a mountain of new money and their solution, which has been the same solution since 1913, frankly, was to devalue the currency through inflation. And they haven't gotten, the central banks have not got control of the inflation that they caused and the problems that they caused and raising rates aren't going to help. To be honest with you, what they're doing isn't working because we are at the end of this life cycle. So this next system with the advent of the Fed now accounts going into effect in July. And we also have the LIBOR SOFR transition, which we may or may not see any of those rumblings by June 30th, but there are rumblings, the biggest experiment in history on this debt bubble that is popping. Um, yeah, I think this next crisis is going to make 2008 look like chump change. And yeah. it's going to scare the crap out of everybody. And that's when they're going to try and and cram the CBDCs down everybody's throats. Can you explain the difference between CBDCs and FedNow? Well, yeah, the CBDC is the actual digital money of the central bank. The Fed now is the account in which they can put it in so that you, the public, has access to it. Simply see, put. What do you see happening if and when they get the public to agree to something like that? Well, it's not whether or not they're going to get the public to agree because we've seen in a number of their countries that have forced their population into the CBDCs by demonetizing the money and creating crisis or, or just by giving people free money, you know, they'll spend what you give them. It's whether or not they will allow like their paycheck to automatically go into the CBDCs. Will they... Uh, will they continue to make deposits into that CBDC account? That's the big question mark because we do vote with our pocketbooks or our wallets. That's how we vote. And that's been a big problem for those countries that have already made that attempt to get their population to accept the CBDCs. You know, I can't, I can't answer that. My hope is no. And the public does not seem to want these CBDCs. But do I think they're going to try and cram it down our throats? Yes. 
and they'll do that through crisis. What could the future look like with CBDCs? And do you think that would affect people's retirement or retirement oh, funds at all? A hundred percent. You know, what a CBDC does, and, and the Fed has even admitted it in the IM International Monetary Fund, the IMF papers that they've written, is see, right now when they make a policy, it takes roughly 12 to 18 months to flow through the system. Did they get what they want? So we're really starting to feel the impact of the rapid rates um, that the Fed did 12, 18 months ago, right? So this way, once they have the CBDC, then they can have their finger on that policy button 24 seven, which is what they've said. So that if they want the consumer to go out and consume and you're not consuming, what are they gonna do? They're gonna drop us into negative rates more deeply so that you're sitting there watching your principal evaporate. And when you're sitting there watching your principal evaporate, what are you most likely to do? But once it's in CBDC form, they can dictate what you can buy with it, how long it even exists, which you're going to see that. At first, they're not going to shock you with anything because they want to lull you into a false sense of security to get you to use it. And they, they've talked many times about this. Um, so at first, it's going to seem kind of normal, like people are used to credit cards. They're, most people are used to credit cards and debit cards and all of that. So, and, and of course they've heard all about the cryptocurrencies and we see what's happening in that arena. And remember recently the, I can't remember whether it was the biz or the IMF, but they came out with a paper, basically private cryptocurrencies, bad, central bank cryptocurrencies, good. So they're trying to get you lulled into a false sense of security. And then once they have you there, and let's say that a lot of the population does make that deposit into that FedNow and CBDC account, right? Um, and especially, you know, we could go into a hyperinflation on the currency that's already out there and then have the Fed controlling the value for a minute of the CBDC. So people go, oh, well, look at this is really bad, but this is staying more stable. And I think that's really what's very, very likely to happen to get you to participate voluntarily. That, frankly makes having physical gold and silver outside of that system critically important. Because if you have everything inside of their system that they have their finger on 24 seven and can dictate everything about it, they have you by the cojones, right? So, so this is why it's absolutely critical for you to be as self-sufficient and independent in, in as many ways as possible. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Because the more independent you are, the less control they will have over you. And they, they are attempting this. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I mean, I really have hope of a revolution. Ray Dalio also thinks that a revolution is coming and I, I agree with him. And because of these repeatable patterns, just like the end of the currency's life cycle. I mean, these patterns, when you know what they look like, then you know where we are in that cycle and you can get into a position to actually not just survive it, but thrive through it and come out the other side in a better position, but you better have physical gold and silver in your possession or heaven help us, heaven help you. Moving into the future of CBDCs and FedNow, if people just go into that blindly, what, is, what does it look like with IRAs, 401ks, retirement plans? All of those other fiat money assets, for lack of a better term, the only thing you can convert them in is to dollars. And so again, if we had this split system, which would make a whole lot of sense for them to do, where you have the current system hyperinflating, and then the CBDC system, where they keep that value more stable, and they might give you the option, well, you can convert this into this. 
And so, you know, I think there would be a lot of people that would grab on to that false lifeline because they could see the value of their investments being absolutely eroded. Just like what we're seeing in Zimbabwe right now, where their stock market is up 600% as they're trying to get people to adopt the CBDC that is presumably backed by gold, but it's not convertible. And if it ain't convertible, it ain't over. I got news for you. It's just another gimmick to get you to get control of you. So people will fly to these things thinking that they are protecting their purchasing power and wealth, but it's a big scam because at the end of the day, in that hyperinflationary mode, they're going to have to do overnight revaluations to get the public to go along with it and to trust it again. But I could easily see a scheme where they kept the value artificially of the CBDC stable and they are going to sell it because this is what they've said. They are going to sell it as, look, if we do CBDCs, there's not going to be any more inflation. So it would make complete sense in their strategy to allow the current system to hyperinflate, maintain artificially the value of the CBDCs until they got you hooked. And then as they say, not me, they say, then there are no limitations to how low we can push interest rates, which means attacking your principal. So if you hold all of your wealth in there, you're, you're, pardon me, you're screwed. But if you hold a chunk of your wealth, as much as you possibly can in physical gold and silver, even if that is our current tool of barter, you're holding your purchasing power and you just convert what you need and protect the rest of your valuation, your purchasing power and your wealth valuation. That, that's what's going to le level this playing field for people. That's what's going to get them through it. No doubt. There isn't one doubt in my mind. Talk about that more, how you convert what you need when you need it and your, I guess, strategy for that where well, I mean, right now there are a lot of dealers that are out there, but uh, you know, what I think is really important places that you can convert. I mean, you can convert gold and silver at pawn shops, jewelry stores, uh, liquidation, uh, smelters, but frankly, the best way to do it is to establish a, a relationship with a reputable dealer like ITM, who's been around since 95, has long-term relationships with wholesalers. You're going to end up better, um, better off. You're going to end up getting more of whatever the current currency is because of the way that our, our network is established. And we've, you know, we've proven ourselves. So what you would do is based upon your strategy, which you can set up a, a call in Calendly so that you understand what the strategy is based on your goals, based on your possible, your current income needs, right? Then you would simply call ITM as an example and say, okay, this is what I need. You'd send it back through. It gets liquidated, it gets deposited in whatever the current fiat currency is, and that's how you do it. Easy peasy. It's no big deal. So you said to make a note about gold and silver IRAs. Right. Yes, thank you. Um, I, mean, I think everybody knows that when I'm making choices, because there isn't anybody out there that can guarantee that they won't do an overt confiscation of gold. I mean, there's lots of historic precedents. There's even current in different countries that are that are confiscating gold right now because gold holds your purchasing power, which is why all the central banks or most of the central banks are accumulating it. So personally, for my choices and also because of my Uncle Al, who in 1964 had two safes full of pre-33 coins when you couldn't, it was illegal to hold more than five ounces except in that way, right? Um, so I have some serious concerns because most people that own gold 
own it inside of an IRA. And it's very, very easy if they were to do an overt confiscation to do a big sweep of the IRAs. Now, they're not going to want you to complain. And since they know that they're destroying the fiat money system, so what if they pay you even a bonus to what the manipulated spot market looks like? just like they did in 33 and then boom, it gets revalued and you're, what are you left with? You think you've got gold, but if you don't hold it, you don't own it and your perception is irrelevant in those kind of circumstances and certainly in a court of law. So I want the kind of gold that you cannot hold inside of an IRA because there is clear past and current precedence for an over confiscation. And let's face it, desperate governments do desperate things. Where do you see real estate falling into the picture in the near future or and or with the changes in CBDCs and so now? Well, you know, real estate is kind of an interesting circumstance. It has definitely been artificially inflated. And if you go back to 2008, you can see the central bank and the Federal Reserve came out and said, you know, these are the areas that we have targeted for reflation, right? So the truth of the matter is, it is severely overvalued on a global basis, especially since what happened since 2020, okay? Now, globally on average, you see a major decline in the price, but you've got to have a place to make your last stand. I mean, you're not going to camp out because real estate is overvalued. So you just need to be in a position that if you had to take out debt in order to do it, so you've got a mortgage, that you have the ability to, boom, pay that debt off in a heartbeat when they do that overnight revaluation right? So there's a strategy around fixed rate debt, which is exactly the same strategy that the governments use. And that is to repay that debt with the currency. So in, in the U.S. with dollars that have less and less value. Would I go out and speculate on real estate right now? No. We've been watching the, um, the, the uh, credit quality decline in purchasers. We've been watching all of these special little give me's to get the most naive buyers of real estate buying real estate again, lower fees, you know, put down less money and therefore you're going to pay fewer fees, which is insane. You know, so watching those kinds of manipulations shows me that they're trying to get the most naive people in the bunch to support this unsupportable, really, real estate market. Um, but having said that, you got to have a place to make your last stand. So whether that's, you know, a roof over your head like, you know, I have my house in Phoenix, which is an urban farm, so I can eat off of that. But also during... 2020, when there were riots near my house and riots near my daughter's house, and I slept in my bed that night with a gun, and I woke up the next morning and said, aha, there is the hole, right? So I went out and it took a while, but I managed to find my bug out house. Did I care how much it cost? Not really, because I believe that it's going to save our lives. And we have a great place, the orchards were just I just was telling you the orchards have been other than a few things that they're still looking for basically in. So stay tuned. You'll be seeing more of that. Um, and it's completely off grid. So I've, and I've got a well. So I, it meets all of the criteria for the mantra, food, water, energy, security, barter, ability, wealth, preservation, community, and shelter. Um, so, you know, with real estate, it, it kind of depends because, because you need it, but would I buy it because I think it's going to go up in terms of fiat dollars? Heck no, no. But would I buy it because it fit into my strategic plan that supported the goals that I'm trying to accomplish? Then, yeah. You mentioned SOFR and LIBOR earlier. What's the simplest mm -hmm. way to understand those two things and what's going on there? Tectonic shift, right? 
I mean, th- I mean, they are so dead silent on this transition. And the problem is kind of what the problem was with the SVB and the other banks that went out in that the value of their holdings because of the increase in the interest rate, the market value of all their holdings declined, right? So when we transition, when we conclude the transition, uh, the end of this month is when it's supposed to be concluded. Even if it's in pennies, you're talking about trillions of dollars worth of contracts. Nobody really has any idea of how many trillions still have to shift. That is a tectonic shift, one that has never been attempted before and is happening into a debt bubble because all of these are debt instruments, right? All these derivatives and and debt contracts that are based, that are shifting, right? So they're shifting into a bubble that is already popping. Whether or not they can keep that hidden for a little bit more, we're going to find out. Just like it seems like the banking crisis is over. No, it is not. And I don't doubt that even one second, and I don't care if it's the smallest community bank. And just recently, Janet Yellen came out and said that she expects more consolidations in banks. That means she expects more banks to go down. And yes, Because the Federal Reserve and global central banks, so it's not just here, it's everywhere. Look at, look at uh, Credit Suisse and UBS, right? You know, globally, we had all those negative rate bonds in, in Europe, et cetera. And we had all those bonds that basically came at, at zero interest rates. And now the interest rates are going up. I mean, I think that's going to change, but the market is, the market's betting that the Federal Reserve is going to go in shortly and drop rates again. So the market no longer trusts what the Fed says because the Fed showed them that they can't trust it. And that, if you remember, that was last August, surprised the Hades out of me when they actually gave up that level of confidence. Because the only level of confidence in this con game left is the public confidence that the currency could never go away, right? And that, uh, I don't know, do people still think the Fed knows what they're doing? That the Treasury knows what they're doing? Has this debt ceiling issue, ah, resolved. But the whole world, they took it to the, to the exact moment, pretty much. And the whole world that is based, the whole marketable world that is based on U.S. treasuries was looking at this and going, that's our bedrock. And they're playing with the bedrock. And now they're going to be issuing a whole bunch of treasuries to fill up the treasury bank book, right? So they can write those checks which by the way is inflationary, by the way, okay? Is that crisis averted? No, we haven't seen the end of that crisis, but this whole thing is based on confidence and it really did a job on a global level, which was already shaky. So yeah, no, we've got lots of issues that can erupt at any moment that we just can't see. So, so far in LIBOR are two different kinds of rates? Correct. LIBOR was created in the 80s, and so you have all of those mortgages, car loans, student loans, which, by the way, people are going to have to start repaying now, coming up in September. They had three years where they didn't, but now they're going to have to. Mortgages, uh, credit cards, and derivative contracts, which and a derivative is just a big unsubstantiated bet against could be a stock or a bond or the weather, whether or not you do your hair up or down. I mean, you know, um, so there's just a lot of leverage, way more leverage that is built into the system today, which is basically debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt, which makes everything look great on the way up, but it also crashes the system on the way down and that bubble is popping. So yes, um, once it was discovered that shockingly, uh, traders were manipulating the LIBOR, 
which was just a few banks getting together and go, gee, if I were going to charge you interest overnight, this is how much I would charge. And if I were going to pay interest overnight, this is how much I would pay. Um, once it was discovered that it was being manipulated, pff, they had a good long run. Uh, then they had to come up with a new benchmark. And so in this country, we came up with SOFR and they have to shift from one to the other. And it, while it's supposed to be a market rate, when you read the really fine print, they eliminate a lot of bonds from that. So is it really a market rate? Meh. And the rate that, that they get for so far is different than the LIBOR rate. So that's why it's a tectonic shift that revalues trillions of dollars worth of assets that have not yet been converted. And those that have been, like especially for leveraged loans, CLOs, which are packages of leveraged loans, what they're finding out is that they're taking in a lot less money as well. So they're fighting it. They're still fighting it. That's a big problem. And we can't, they're not talking about it. Why aren't you talking about the biggest experiment in history? Why aren't you talking about it? Kind of makes me nervous. So it may be a big fat nothing burger, but I don't think so. It's just when are we going to notice it? LIBOR is London, so far U.S. Well, LIBOR, yes, is a London interbank offer rate, but, but it was used globally. Okay, and so far is at this point, primarily being used in the U.S., but that too could be used globally, but I don't think it's going to make it. There there were uh, like about five central banks that came up with their own interest rate, new interest rate benchmark. So we'll see. But even, even uh, what they did to try and fix that difference was come up with some kind of mathematical formula. But even with that formula, they cannot get it to match LIBOR. So that means that the valuation of all of these contracts that are based on LIBOR and shifting into so far, those valuations change. You can't tell me that's a nothing burger because I don't believe it on on how many contracts? Who knows? They're, they were saying something like over 610 trillion, but nobody really knows how, I mean, admittedly, nobody really knows how many derivative contracts there are out there. And before they changed the accounting rules, I personally, with my own eyes at the Bank for International Settlements, counted 1.4 quadrillion. And that I think was like in 2009. And that market has exploded since then. So how many quadrillions? There's no way to bail it out. No flipping way, period, period. Why do you think people, why do you think so many people are confused right now? And what can they be doing to protect themselves? Well, I think that people are confused because there is definitely the normalcy bias, right? And what we're asking them to do is have a paradigm shift. And that means that you have to admit that what you have believed to be true, what you've been taught to be true your entire life is a lie. And that's very hard for people to do. But they knew this when they set the system up with inflation baked in it, right? So, um, and, and I'll tell you an interesting story because you know I just got back from Italy, right? And Natali, our, our guide, but I've known him since 2009, we were talking about his personal experience when they shifted from the lira, the Italian currency, into the euro, right? And he said, and I, I knew this, he, did, he didn't recognize the first part of it, where they devalued the currency by 17% to get they supposedly on par with everybody so they could make this transition. And then when they made the transition, if say a loaf of bread cost you two lira, it cost you two euros, except that it took four lira to buy those two euros. So immediately you lost what, 50%, 100% of its value, right? And he was telling me, but he couldn't charge twice as much for his services because that was too much, right? So 
I made a comment about um, how that union was set up, and there have been lots of studies on it, where it was sold as it's going to level the playing field for all of these countries. But in reality, it was set up for Germany, that is a nation of savers, to benefit the most by loaning money to all of these other countries so that those countries and those individuals in those countries could buy goods from Germany and take on that debt. And so where it was supposed to level the playing field, don't hold me to this because obviously I'm not looking at this, but if I recall um, something like 96% of the populations in the other countries, their standard of living had declined dramatically. And when I told him that, and even based on his personal experience, he said to me, well, Lynette, I'm surprised that you would say that because we've been talking about community and meeting community all this trip. And here you are saying that this community is not a good one. And I said to him, so, so number one, there's your normalcy bias. He admitted how that transition had a negative impact on his personal standard of living, right? And he knew it absolutely knew it. And yet when it came down to the bottom line, it was definitely supportive of the union and even the currency union. So for me, that was a normalcy bias because when they set up the system, they knew, they knew many things, but they knew two key things. Number one, people marry the legal money of the state. And number two, not one man in a million understands inflation. And that's how they've been able to take advantage of us. So understanding that that's where they are. And the only thing we are at the end of this currency's life cycle, period, end of discussion. The only thing that can protect you from it is to be secure in the whole mantra. But you got to have this. That's why you see on a global basis, central banks buying gold hand over fist at the highest levels ever, because they absolutely know that they're destroying the last little bit of whatever happens to be in their fiat money and trying to transition us into a new system, whether or not that's going to work. I don't know. I hope it doesn't. I hope we have that revolution so that we can have a more fair system because the system that they have in mind for us is a full surveillance system where they control. If you are completely dependent on that system, they can control every single aspect of your life and look at where they've taken us to so far. They've done such a great job for themselves, but not for you and me. So what you can do is execute the strategy and make sure that you are secure in food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter so that you don't have, they can't dictate to you. If you're not, they're going to be able to dictate to you. And I'm pretty sure even though you will own nothing, you will not be happy. And you prioritized your wealth preservation first. So oh, absolutely. So you could fund all of your sustainability projects. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, you might've seen that in May, Turkey sold a bunch of gold. And so you could say, oh, well, why did Turkey sell the gold? Because this is your savings, right? This ensures your wealth preservation and your purchasing power. It has for thousands of years. And so what you would all have also noticed if you looked at the report is that China and India and a number of other countries added too. And when Turkey had to sell off, it was to be able to buy things it was their savings that were able to buy things that they needed. So yes, a hundred percent, you, you know, it's, it's just like if you're in an airplane and you're going down and the oxygen mask comes down, what do you do? You're supposed to put that on first 
and then you can help the child next to you, even though you would give up your life for that child, right? So yes, that's why you, you get your wealth preserved and your ability to purchase, you know, short barter, you get that done first. Then that's your, that's your oxygen mask. Then you can do everything else. And don't wait because we are running out of time. I can't tell you exactly the moment. I'm not going to know it before you or anybody else. But I'm hoping and I'm thinking that I am going to know when this gig is up completely. And then we get to our bug out house. Thanks, Lynette. Appreciate the time. My pleasure. But just remember, wealth shields are made of physical gold physical silver in your possession.